Hi, I'm Ed Bacon, the rector of All Saints Church Pasadena. Whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on the journey of faith, I hope that you'll find something here that speaks to you. Welcome. And now in the name of our loving, liberating, and life-giving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please. Good morning. It is a privilege to be here at All Saints and to be with you on this Pentecost day. Um, I am um, one who um, not simply admires but greatly respects and prays God's blessing, continued blessing, on the witness of this community, of All Saints, to the love of God in Jesus. Your witness matters, let me tell you. And we pay attention in North Carolina. We pay attention and thank God for you because it does matter. So so don't you get weary because there's a great camp meeting in the promised land. Just keep on. (laughs) And and it is a privilege for me. I I have to say, I heard the choir at the at the last Eucharist and um, they're going back to North Carolina with me. (laughs) I'm bringing y'all back. Come on. (laughs) Awesome. And. The, the clergy that you have, uh, Ed, Susan, and Zelda, what shall I say? I, I searched for a metaphor on the plane. I thought long and hard. I prayed. I asked Jesus to give me some revelation. And the only thing that came to mind was Gladys Knight and the Pips. <laughs> I just thank God for them and for you and, and for your witness to to the love of Jesus. I just thank God for you. So I'm glad to be here, and I bring you greetings from your brothers and sisters in North Carolina, in the diocese there. I'm glad to be here. I hope you are. Well, you turn and tell your neighbor you're glad to be here. Just turn and tell somebody. It's good to be here. It's good to be here. It is good. Allow me to offer a word from a passage that comes right before the story of Pentecost, the birth of the church, if you will, when the Spirit is poured out. Um, Before that happens, in chapter 1 of of the Acts of the Apostle, Jesus has a last conversation with the disciples before he is taken up into the fullness of God. And here's how the conversation goes. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, in first century Palestine, and 21st century Pasadena. You, Episcopalians, will be my witnesses. Oh, we need some witnesses now. Oh, yeah, we need some witnesses. And we need some Episcopalian witnesses. We need some mainline church witnesses. And and no longer sideline, mainline. We need some witnesses. Now, when I look at that passage, one of the things that strikes me is that this is that kind of one of those last conversation between Jesus and his disciples. And they they say, Lord, um, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, what's going on there is you got to remember Jesus has just been raised from the dead 40 days before. I mean, so they've gone through the heartache and the horror of his execution and torture um, and his death. And then they've gone through the incredible miracle and exhilaration of realizing that the brother wasn't down for the count. (laughs) He got up. And he was alive. And and I I like to tell folk in North Carolina, if the brother didn't get up, I'm going home. (laughs) I can make more money doing something else than this. I mean... They realized he was alive. I mean, he was risen, transformed. The new creation was breaking in. And so they were like beside themselves with joy. And they said, Lord, this is it. You've been raised from the dead. The kingdom's going to come, which means...
means God's reign is going to come in its fullness. Is this the time now when, when poverty will become history? Is this the time when we will learn to lay down our swords and shields down by the riverside and study war no more? Is this the time when we're going to end hunger? Is this the time when we're going to end bigotry? Is this the time when God's love is going to break out and everything's going to be wonderful? I think I just hit a cup of water behind me. (laughs) Which is a divine response saying, no, this is not the time. (laughs) But you can imagine, that's what they're asking. This must be at the inbreaking of the kingdom in its fullness. And Jesus says to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Which is a biblical way of saying, that ain't your business. <laughs> See, my, my grandma used to sing that, that hymn, we'll understand it better by and by. There's some things we're not going to figure out right now. There's some things we're not going to understand Um, And the truth is, that's not our business. Jesus said, that's not yours to worry about. That's God's business. Your business is to witness. Because when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses, says Jesus. You will witness to the way that I love, witness to the way that I give, the way that I forgive, the way that I live. You'll witness to me, even Episcopalians. (laughs) Now, And and the truth is, I mean, it's all over the Bible. It's there um, in the 43rd chapter of Isaiah. Um, God says to the prophet Isaiah, he says, the people of Israel will be my witnesses in the world. And in the 49th chapter, he continues this witness theme and says, you will be a light to the nations. In, In John's gospel, John the Baptist is identified as one who is a witness. He came to bear witness to Jesus. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness to the light. And in John's gospel, we who follow in the footsteps of Jesus of Nazareth are meant to bear witness. In Luke's gospel, Luke's gospel ends with Jesus after the crucifixion and resurrection, telling them it was necessary for the Son of Man to suffer death and to rise from the dead so that forgiveness of sin might be proclaimed to all the nations. And then he says to the disciples, you are witnesses of these things. I mean, you can't escape it. It's all over the Bible. But I've been an Episcopalian all my life, and I know Episcopalians, and many of them are lawyers. (laughs) And if there is a loophole, Episcopalians will find it. And, And the default loophole is, well, it may be in the Bible, but if it's not in the prayer book, We don't have to do it. So I went and searched the prayer book. And lo and behold, on page 302, um, at the service of baptism and holy confirmation, uh, we pray over the... This is in the prayer book. I'm not making this up. We pray over the candidates. Send them out as witnesses to your love. Uh, There's no escape. (laughs) Page 366, one of our post-communion prayers at the end of the Eucharist prays, and I quote, And now, Father... Send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. And then if that's not enough, if you still had not gotten it, page 855, in the catechism, the teachings of the church, uh, we're asked, what is the ministry of laypersons? And the answer in the prayer book is, the ministry of laypersons, which means everybody, that's clergy and lay, um, the ministry of laypersons is to represent Christ and his church and to bear witness to him wherever they may be. Oh, my brothers and sisters, guess what? <laughs> there is no escape. And, and I know how difficult it is because, uh, you know, I mean, if, I like to say, you know, if you really want to give an Episcopalian heartburn, Ask them had they been saved. And if you want to give them a heart attack, tell them to go out and witness. <laughs> but there's no escape from the prayer book or Bible. Jesus says, witness, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, 1st century, 21st century. I need you to be my witnesses. Oh, my friends, we need some witnesses. And I know that's a scary thing because when I hear the word witness, What comes to mind is a Saturday morning and the grass has just been cut and you can smell it and you're having a morning cup of coffee and you're reading the newspaper or you're reading on your 
pad and you see two people walking down the street <laughs> and they got little watchtower magazines in their bag and you get up and you quietly go up and close the door to pretend that you aren't home. <laughs> that, that, that's what I suspect we hear when we hear that word. Am I telling the truth or am I just projecting on y'all? I mean, I think I'm telling the truth. And so I get that. I really do get that. But it occurs to me that the scripture, Jesus gave us a way to understand witness. In the Sermon on the Mount, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, blessed are the poor and the poor in spirit, blessed are the merciful, blessed are those who hunger and thirst that God's righteous justice might prevail, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those who are persecuted just because they tried to love somebody, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, pray for those who despitefully use you, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And then Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, when you do this, you are the light of the world. So let your light so shine that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. There is a song that many of us learned as children. I learned it in Sunday school, vacation Bible school, that is based on that text in the Sermon on the Mount. It goes like this, this little light of mine. Y'all know that one? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh, we're going to baptize some people today. And, and after they are baptized, one of the clergy is going to take a light from the Paschal candle, the candle of resurrection, and is going to give the light of Christ to the newly baptized because you've been baptized to witness. You've been called to witness. You're here today so you can go out in that world and witness to Jesus, to witness to his love, witness to his goodness, witness to his compassion. Oh, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Now, I'm convinced this really matters. It matters in all time. But it matters in our time. A few years ago, I, um, a number of years ago, members of our diocesan staff sat me down and said, look, we need you to get on Facebook, to get, you know, we need to get this message out there. And I have to admit, there was a part of me that was resistant because I didn't need one more thing on my plate. It just seemed like this was going to be more work to do. But so I'm on Facebook and I'm on Twitter. I mean, I'm learning from Susan. This sister has been tweeting me. I have never been so tweeted in all my life. <laughs> But, you know, <laughs> but I tell you, you want to get the good news out, get it out there. But anyway, so they were getting me on Facebook, and so I, you know, I got a, they gave me a tutorial session for a whole afternoon and just showed me how to do it. And so, you know, when you get on Facebook, you have to fill out the information thing, which is biographical information. And so I put on my name and schools and all that kind of stuff. And um, then I got to the question, uh, religious affiliation or something like that. And I started almost on autopilot to type in Christian. And I hesitated. Don't misunderstand me. I, I, I believe in Jesus. I'm into the Christian thing. I mean, look at me. Do you think I'm, I mean, <laughs> obviously I'm not doing this for the money. I mean, you know. Uh, <laughs> so that, that, that wasn't the issue, but I hesitated because I realized that when I put that something out on Facebook and social media, it's spinning out into orbit. And it occurred to me that that word Christian has very often been held hostage to hatred and bigotry and narrow-mindedness and judgmentalism. The very word Christian has been sometimes twisted and distorted into being something that doesn't look anything like Jesus Christ. And, and so I hesitated, and I came up with a compromise. I, I, I typed in Christian-Episcopalian. I figured nobody would know what that means anyway. So it, and, 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 and I'm convinced that, that we really do need witnesses. We need, I was on a forum, an interfaith forum um, at Elon University where they have constructed um, a multi-faith pavilion where all the religious traditions are housed. and very, It is a marvelous thing in Elon, North Carolina. It's awesome. Anyway, we were on this uh, forum together with uh, leaders from different religious traditions. And um, at one point, it occurred to me that, you know something? All of our religions have been taken hostage by extremists. 
And it is time for the sensible center to stand up and to rise up in all of our religious traditions. All of them. And we who would follow Jesus of Nazareth, this is a moment for, for folk like Episcopalians, mainstream folk, to, to rise up for a way of being Christian that looks something like Jesus. Am I right? The Jesus who said the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? Because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who, all who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The Jesus who said, by this the world will know that you are my disciples. Not that you can recite the creed. That's good. It's important. But that's not how the world's going to know you are my disciples. Not that you tithe and give your money to All Saints Church. Well, on second thought, maybe you should do that. But the world's not going to know your disciples, but it's not going to know your disciples just by coming to church. This is important. Don't misunderstand me. But Jesus said, by this the world will know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. That's what Jesus taught. He said, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself on these two. Love God. Love your neighbor. Change the world on those two. That's what it's all about. That's what Jesus stood for. And my friends, we need some witnesses to a way of being Christian that looks something like Jesus. Oh. My, my wife and I went to see the movie 42. Story of Jackie Robinson, Branch Rickey. I don't know. Have you all seen it? Have you, yeah. And if you haven't, go. It's worth it. I guess it's still in the theaters. It's worth it. It's a story of Jackie Robinson and his entrance into the Major Leagues Baseball. Story of Branch Rickey, general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, who believed passionately that the game he loved, baseball, must be desegregated. America was racially segregated in the 1940s, and baseball was America's game. And you had the Negro Leagues, the American League, the National League, and they were racially segregated. And the truth is, baseball was the field not only of dreams, but it was the field of America's nightmare. Hatred, bigotry incarnated itself on the field of play. And Branch Rickey decided that he was going to change it because he loved baseball enough to do something. So he eventually decided he was going to bring up a ball player from the Negro Leagues, get him through the minor leagues, send him to Montreal, and then eventually to Brooklyn. And they landed on Jackie Robinson, who you all know, Jackie Robinson. And um, at one point, there were a number of other players they could have brought up but they landed on Robinson in part because the guy was clean and, and he, he was pretty much untouchable. They needed somebody um, who didn't have other issues that were going to complicate it, um, like a lot of drinking and carousing and that kind of stuff. Um, Jackie Robinson went home and was a pretty good guy. He actually went to church. Amazing. A miracle. He went to church. And um, so they needed somebody pretty clean like that because they knew this guy was going to become the target of hatred and, and of death threats. And I mean, he, they knew and so they landed on Robinson, and, and, and Branch Rickey, the day he finally decided, was sitting in his office, and one of his aides was trying to persuade him to look at some other possibilities, and he said, I'm going with Robinson. And the aide said, well, why are you going to go with Jackie Robinson? There's, you know, other players. He said, Robinson's a Methodist. I'm a Methodist, and God's a Methodist. I'm going with Robinson. And that was pretty much it. And so they brought him up. He went to, went to Montreal, played ball, and eventually came into the majors and made history. But it was a tough road to hoe. I mean, it was tough. He was threatened with death. Folk threw watermelons at him. He was hated. He was called every name but a child of God. But Ricky stood by him. In fact, there was one scene, I'm not going to ruin the movie for it, but there was one moment when the Philadelphia Phillies were refusing to play the Brooklyn Dodgers if Robinson was on the field. And so Branch Rickey, I like Branch Rickey. He was, um, he was a Methodist, um, but he, he, well, no, I like Methodists too, but I mean, he, 
but he, he was, you know, he was kind of an unconventional Christian because he like chewed tobacco, chewed cigars. He cussed like a sailor. That's, and I want to suggest that's exactly what we need, some cigar-chewing, cussing Christians. <laughs> and so he calls up the Philadelphia Phillies general manager and, and who's refusing to play with Robinson on the team, and he said, you believe God loves baseball? The guy said, well, okay, yeah, I guess he does. Yeah, okay. He said, well, what are you going to say on Judgment Day when he asks you how come you didn't play the Brooklyn Dodgers and you tell him it was because Jackie Robinson was on the team. I don't think that's going to be a satisfactory answer. <laughs> I mean, this guy really did passionately believe. He actually believed that it was God's will that we live together as human beings in human community. He didn't know the phrase, but he was talking about what Verna Dozier and Desmond Tutu have taught us. He was talking about the dream of God and trying to end the nightmare of humanity. That's what he was about. There was one moment when he finally brought Robinson in and the two of them met and they had to decide if they were going to do this thing. And at one point, Ricky said to Robinson, I need a ball player who won't fight back because they're going to try to make you fight back and they're going to hate you and they're going to spit on you. I need somebody who won't fight back. Robinson said, oh, you want a Negro who's afraid to fight back. And Ricky said, no, I want a ball player who has the courage not to fight back, just like our Savior who went to the cross. And in the biographies of Ricky, not in the movie, at that moment, Ricky reached into his drawer and took out a little book called The Life of Christ. And he read to Jackie Robinson from the Sermon on the Mount. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. And after that, Robinson said yes. And those two men changed baseball. And baseball helped to change America. And it has helped to continue to change the world. Don't ever be deceived. Witness to Jesus makes a difference. So all saints, don't you give up. Don't you get weary. Stand up for love. Stand up for goodness. Stand up for compassion. Stand up for justice. Stand up for Jesus and go forth and witness to that Jesus in this world. Oh, sing with me now. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine.